Good evening. Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am so excited about the turnout tonight. I um, was talking with the presenters here and um, this is our largest crowd that registered. I see more people are trickling in, so this is great. I'm so excited to see us grow the lifelong learning of scholars, lectures growing, so this is great. Thank you. Um, the presentation, Automate When Technology Becomes a Teammate, our presenters will talk about automated and autonomous systems such as drones, autonomous cars, and artificial intelligent agents are becoming increasingly prevalent in our society. As these technologies become increasingly intelligent and autonomous, how we react with them will inevitably change. This presentation will discuss the distinction between such technology as a tool or a team or a teammate and share research on how our trust in these systems develop, degrade, and rebounds as we work side by side with them. So I'm excited to present today um, Dr. Meredith Carroll, Dr. Amanda Thayer, there, there, sorry, and Dr. Jessica Wildman. Thank you. We study cognition and learning in a range of domains, commercial aviation, military aviation, unmanned aerial systems, more recently electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft in the new urban air mobility domain. Um, and so within that, human machine teaming is really my focus, and more recently, human autonomy teaming. And so I've been here about eight years, and when I started, I met Jesse, and we have tried for years to come up with a way to collaborate. She's in the IO psychology department, and so this was a perfect opportunity because I studied human-machine interaction and Jesse and Amanda from the IO department studied human-human teams. And so it was a match made in heaven and that we were able to kind of bring our disciplines together for this research. Hey everyone, Dr. Jessica Wildman. Oh, Mike. Um, I am the uh, program chair and a professor in industrial organizational psychology, the graduate program for the master's and the PhD at Florida Tech. I'm also the research director for the Institute for Culture Collaboration and Management. So my historical background of research is in the area of culture, diversity, and interpersonal trust in the workplace. And again, typically I study human-human relationships. I really didn't think about agents or robots before that. But when we started talking, we were looking for areas where we could bring our ideas together. This has been a really great experience being able to take my prior research, my prior experience, and apply it to a new area, which is human agency. Glad to be here tonight. <laughs> All right, hi everyone. Um, thank you for coming this evening. My name is Amanda Thayer. I'm an associate professor of industrial organizational psychology um, and the growth and development director for the Institute for Culture Collaboration and Management. So Jesse and I work very closely together um, and have a very similar background, um, actually having hailed from the same graduate program. So we are, we are academic siblings. Yes. <laughs> so um, my interests are also in uh, teams and collaboration, broadly speaking. Um, and within that, really um, uh, identifying how we can um, build and compose high performing um, and cohesive teams. Um, as well as uh, things like trust violation and repair, um, and uh, developing methods for researching and for assessing teamwork and team performance. Um, and so this, uh, I'll echo Jesse and just kind of say this has been a really great project um, to kind of take um, the things that I've been thinking about in the human-human space for so long, um, and then kind of think about, okay, what are the things that really are kind of uh, similar and that we can kind of take take what we know from human-human teams and apply them to human agent teams, and where are there some unique things that we need to consider when you have a non-human teammate? So I'm um, looking forward to um, presenting some of our work. And so this work is actually funded by the Air Force. It's funded by the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. I meant to say that earlier. 
So automation, autonomy is becoming prevalent, right? Because everywhere you go, you guys probably all interact with it to some degree. Um, for instance, we're seeing around the world now robot waiters. Anyone ever seen those? They can bring food to your table, clear your table, sometimes take orders. So what do you think? So do you think they can get you the right thing? So warm? Does it change the experience, the, the restaurant experience? Um, can they pick up on subtleties when it's not a good time to come to the table to ask to, to you know, or um, if, if maybe you're not enjoying your meal, a human can sometimes tell that. Well, so these are being used around, especially in the country, really to deal with some of the workforce shortages. And what restaurant owners say is that this actually frees up the servers that they do have their time to socialize more, chat more with the customers, because they can do the things like clearing away. So it's actually kind of been a really good experience for a lot of people. Um, but really it depends, right? It, whether, how much you trust these tech, this technology, and how well it does its job, really depends on a lot of things, and especially the tasks. So let's look at a couple other examples. All right, so um, by a show of hands, how many of you would put money on an AI tutor, so an artificial agent, being able to boost your students' grades by the end of the semester? I'm sure we have some um, current and, and or former faculty in the room. No, I'm seeing, I'm seeing some skeptics. Well, guess what? It is happening. Um, it is whether you uh, whether we like it or not, it's happening. Um, so um, the founder of a company I don't know how many of you are familiar with Khan Academy, but it's a, a, a nonprofit, really available uh, resource. I actually used it with my child when we were in the COVID uh, era of having little ones at home. Um, so um, anyway, the, the um, Khan Academy has started to develop an AI uh, robot bot that um, called Conmigo. Um, and this is a chat base, so chat GPT, if you're familiar with that, uh, that's been a, a big thing. Basically having automated agents, um, at automated bots that are able to provide information. Um, so this uh, Conmigo is being deployed um, across um, uh, some of their, their private schools in, in, in pilot testing. Um, and the goal really is to uh, span a wide range. So they have everything from elementary math to college level chemistry um, that's making what once was a difficult resource to access, one-on-one -on -one tutoring, more readily available to the masses. Um, because within the classroom, it's sometimes it just is not possible for a teacher to provide one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, attention to every single student. And so, um, uh, Comigo is starting to bring this to the forefront with uh, uh, boosting students' grades, and so we'll see we'll see you know kind of what they find and, and how that goes. Awesome. Okay, so a different example, another place where artificial intelligence is being applied more these days is in physical training. So um, I'm guessing maybe this is less common. Anyone using a an, an physical training app or some sort of technology? Maybe a workout app these days. Yep, some of that. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, so there, there are fitness apps that are actually using algorithms and data from their users in order to customize and really like adapt the program to the individual user. Um, for example, one of the most popular apps, Free, Freeletics, is leveraging data from over 55 million subscribers in order to try and predict what workout regimen, what approach is gonna be most effective for that particular user. And um, while Freeletics is one of the most popular ones, there's a lot of other like workout platforms that are using this these days. Uh, the current uh, AI that's being used in that is pretty good at a few things. It's good at having a huge repertoire of workouts to, set, to give to you, lots of different moves to tell you what to do and when to do it, right? Um, but it's missing a couple of key elements that you get when you have a human physical trainer. So it's not quite as good at correcting improper form, though they're working on that, right? With like wearables and with body sensing technology, it can tell where you are and try and tell you to like drop your shoulder down, right? Move your body a little bit, but it's not quite there yet. The other thing it's not very good at is motivating people, right? Um, and then also um, having that social interaction that comes along with when you actually have a personal trainer or instructor at the at an actual group class. So I can think of examples like this. I, I use videos at home sometimes. And honestly, it doesn't matter how much Jillian Michaels is yelling at me. I can ignore her all I want, right? But when I go into an actual class, I'm a lot more likely to feel a little pressure to, to perform and to show that person that yes, I'm going to try hard because they asked me to. Um, but again, as ChatGPT, as that natural language processing is improving, as technology is ramping up and becoming even more um, developed these days, I think you may see in the future these, these kinds of apps having a little more of that social 
social interaction that you might expect. Maybe they actually will be looking for some interaction with the, the users, so that's an interesting one. Um, this may be more familiar in that um, a lot more cars these days are having some form of self-driving or assisted driving features. So anybody have a car that has any sort of self-driving or assisted driving features in here, right? So as a Tesla driver myself, I also have experience with this. I don't have full self-driving, that's too much money. Um, and also like Melbourne roads are not really meant for that. <laughs> um, but I do have the, um, the auto steer or the autopilot feature, right? And so I can tell you so many stories of times when that's gone well and when that's gone poorly. So for example, coming home from the Orlando airport after a, a long trip away for work late at night when the roads are very empty and it's a straight shot home, that car has that. I am not worried about it. I've watched it do essentially that entire drive by itself. Of course, I'm paying attention. I'm not doing anything stupid. Um, but it's really nice when you're exhausted to have that little assistance. Now, on the other hand, there is this mysterious strip of road in Vero Beach that I just experienced like last weekend, actually, um, where for whatever reason, like autopilot cannot tell where the turn lanes start. And it just, boom, every we single time. The same. Yes. We also a Tesla, we're the same person. Um, <laughs> but also have a Tesla, we, we went together and we experienced the same thing. Took our kids to Botanical yeah. Garden. Um, but yeah, it, for whatever reason, it just can't, even though it's very well marked, the roads are marked nicely and it just can't, it, something's going wrong. So in that moment, I'm ready, we're ready to intervene, we're turning off autopilot, right? So there's very big differences. Um, anyone have any fun stories of either really good autopilot or automated, automated driving or poor, poor, hopefully nothing too bad? Yeah. Um, I was backing up and I didn't see something behind me and the car stopped me. Like yeah, so the safety features honestly are very helpful. I mean, I think there's probably many accidents that have been prevented with things like that. Right. seeing it. I had it tell me to put my hands back on the wheel. Yeah, yeah, it will remind you. You need to be doing that. And again, I think it, it, obviously there's some applications where you shouldn't be doing that, but if you're a little tired, that little beep, beep, beep to get you back to focusing is really helpful. Yeah. Um, when my mom was driving the highway to work, too, too many long hours, it told her to take a break and get it off. Yeah. Oh, wow. See, isn't that nice? And so like, it's, it's really like almost like a friend being like, hey, listen, this is probably a good idea. So I think there's some really great features that are coming out of this technology. And then one more example is a robot dog. So this probably isn't quite as commonly seen. Um, so in an emergency, would you trust it? This is a dog, that, a robot dog that's now available in emergency situations um, to go in and search for people in areas that either humans can't obtain access to or doesn't have vantage points for. It, it, it's waterproof. It's got IR sensors, thermal sensors, and it's super robust. So I actually had the opportunity to see, this is a video I took at the Air Force Academy just like a, like a month ago. Um, a little freaky, this thing. But yeah, it's so so it will walk up to you, it senses you. Um, it's super robust. The, 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 the airman tried to demonstrate how robust he kicked him up, tried to kick him over several times as hard as he could, and then the dog will kind of catch himself. And so they're incredibly robust, they can sense you. And so in the future, um, these these robots could be used, say, to identify like a, a, an escape route in a, in a fire, right? So it could be pulling, using AI, to, so pulling satellite imagery, being able to real-time map out, based on what's going on with the fire, the best route. So would you follow a dog like that? You think? Even though it's a little freaky. I did, there was a little, I did, did see, you can see how this thing. It, it's a little freaky. And we're going to talk about the uncanny valley in a minute. Um, but so there's, there's a lot of examples like this. And, and so what we're going to talk about to, to you about today is what does it take for us to trust in an artificial, art, artificially intelligent agent? And the answer is it depends on a lot of things, right? There's a lot of factors that influence it. And, and some of those factors are related to the agent and, and different characteristics of it. So for instance, um, how human-like it is. So this is called anthropomorphism, right? And so research has shown that the more human, typically, that an autonomous agent is, the more likely you are to trust it, right? And so there is research that's shown that, that really the implementation matters. So there's like a study recently has looked at whether or not um, an, an embedded AI agent had eyes or not. They found that, that, that when they didn't have eyes, that actually they were viewed as more reliable. And so there's something that's actually known as the uncanny valley. And so we really like our agents to be very human-like to a point. Because once they get really human-like but aren't exactly like a human, there's this thing called the uncanny valley in which it kind of freaks us out and we create, have like kind of an aversion.
versions. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever encountered like a really freaky like robot that was like so human? And I have a little bit with that robot dog. There was something about like it wasn't a dog, but it moved, it moved like a dog. And, and so you have to be careful because this is something that can influence our trust in the agent. Another factor is the embodiment. So um, autonomous agents can come in the form of like an actual physical robot. Um, can come in the form of a virtual avatar, like in a virtual environment or like a video game, or even embedded um, in something in another technology, something like Alexa, right? And so our trust is influenced differently based on the type of embodiment there is, right? So physical robots, we tend to have very low, humans tend to have very low trust in these things, but we will follow the most bizarre recommendations from them despite that. So I just saw the most interesting study brief. It was actually a little, little scary. So. Um, it was a university out in California that briefed at this, the Air Force Academy that I was just at. So they did a study where they brought in participants, college participants, and to a room in their university, and they introduced them to a physical robot, and they interacted with it and talked with it, and they immersed in, uh, uh, put on an h and and immersed in a virtual environment, and that there was a virtual avatar of that same robot there. And, and so they talk with it, and all of a sudden, there's an active shooter situation. And this V is realistic. You hear shots, there's blood splatter, and people start running. And so the robot's like, follow me, I'll show you the quickest way to get out. And so you see the robot lead this person in the opposite direction that everyone else is running. Past exits, and you know what? Almost every, the majority of people follow them. And they don't trust this robot, because you see, they show video of the person, and you're passing exit, and the people are going like, but they continue to follow them, the majority of people. So it's interesting the level of influence some of these autonomous agents have over us. With virtual agents, like in a virtual video game, we tend to have very high trust in them, but as soon as they do something wrong, that trust drops off. And with embedded agents, oftentimes people don't even realize there's a level of intelligence involved. So like, you know, your Facebook is tracking everything you're doing and then tailoring the ads, right? So that is a form of artificial intelligence. There's other factors that influence it, like um, how well, how, how its ability to perform tasks effectively, how benevolent or caring it is, and also how much integrity it has or how much it, its perceived moral values align with yours, right? So the better something is at performing, uh, the better an agent is at performing a task effectively, the more we trust it. The more caring and compassionate it seems towards us, the more we trust it. And the more we feel like its intentions and what it's trying to do align with our values, the more we will trust it. Another factor is the level of autonomy. So level of autonomy is how much, in the, how much an, an autonomous agent can independently make decisions and take actions without input from the user, right? And so there was a lot of research that looked into this about 10 years ago, um, and they found that the higher the autonomy, actually the less trust we have. However, more recent studies, and one that we, we conducted just a couple years ago, has found that there's no longer this relationship, right? And so as we see autonomy become more prevalent, you're seeing people probably, this is probably due to people becoming more com comfortable with it and trusting a little more. A couple more things, so transparency. Um, so transparency has to do with, is it clear to the user what the automation, what the autonomous agent is doing and why? So like, can we see like, and understand the actions it's taking and kind of what's driving that? Um, so, so it turns out that the more we understand what the agent is doing and why, the more we trust it. This has been the driving force behind um, a somewhat new field of study called explainable AI, explainable artificial intelligence, in which there's been a big push towards designing interfaces that help us understand what AI is doing, what autonomous agents are doing and why. Um, so the more we can understand this, the more we're likely to trust it and use it. Um, we're also more likely to trust autonomy that is, more, that is reliable and predictable, right? So if it's doing what it needs to do over and over again, I develop trust in it, right? If its actions and behaviors are predictable and do what I expect, I'm much more likely to trust it. All right, so uh, the characteristics of the agent are honestly probably one of the biggest sets of predictors in terms of why you would trust it, right? Because it's about the thing you're trusting. But there's also a set of traits about yourself that influence whether or not you're gonna trust an agent in general. And so I'm gonna talk about a couple of those. So one of the most commonly studied and probably the strongest predictor in terms of an individual trait that relates to trust is what's known as propensity to trust. And that's just like it sounds. It's your general, typical tendency towards trusting. This is studied in the human-human realm as well. You, you know, have a propensity to trust other people, and, and people vary in this, cultures vary in this, like how much you just immediately trust someone that is a stranger that you don't know yet. 
Um, but when we're talking about agents, it's generally trust in technology or trust in agents that's what we're talking about rather than like a trust in human situation. Um, but really what this is telling us overall is that individuals, person to person, sort of differ in general and how, and how much they're going to trust any given agent. And some people are just very distrusting and other people are, are more trusting to begin with. Relatedly, <coughs> positive attitudes are a predictor of trust. So if you're somebody who feels good things about agents and technology, you see it as beneficial, you feel really comfortable with it, you've had a lot of exposure to it, then you're more likely to trust in those kinds of agents. And this has been shown to be true across a number of domains. So that's true in combat, it's true in automated driving, it's been looked at in a couple different um, not surprisingly, another thing that relates to whether or not you trust an artificial intelligence or an agent is your level of technology self-efficacy. And what this is saying is essentially how comfortable are you with technology? If you're somebody who's very tech savvy, you're very adept at learning and using a technology so you feel very confident that you're going to be able to go in there and use that system, you're more likely to trust it. So it's not very unexpected there, but that's very helpful. Personality is a little bit more of a mixed bag. This has been looked at in a number of different ways. You've probably heard of extroversion. Um, I think it gets talked about a lot in the news. You've probably thought about whether or not you yourself are more introverted or extroverted, right? Um, so what the research has said is that, or at least expects, is that extroverts will be more likely to trust agents because they're outgoing, they're sociable, they're gonna sort of like, like those interactions with the agent more. That said, there's also some evidence that's not true, so the jury's kind of out on that. There's also a little bit of evidence that's pretty um, insubstantial, there's not a lot there yet, that if you're more agreeable, if you're less neurotic, and if you're more conscientious, that you will trust agents more. But again, there's a lot of uh, areas here where, that need a little bit more research. It's a little more mixed in this area. Two things that definitely relate to trust in an agent, though, domain expertise and your past experiences. So this is saying that if you are an expert in whatever the task at hand is, whether you're, you're, re you're a really great driver, you're really great at using your car, you're really great at using your system, um, and you have a lot of experience with that particular agent, right? You've been using it for years and years. You're more likely to trust it. And there's a couple of reasons for this, right? If you're a task, the task expert, then you are going to know what to expect more. You're, you're coming into things with um, more resources freed up. It's gonna be like a, less, a lower cognitive load to be engaging in that task. And when you have those lower cognitive demands, that frees up space for you to trust the agent. It also means that if you have experience with that agent, it's all about predictability, right? So if you've experienced it before, you've seen things happen, you know what to expect, maybe you've run into a lot of different situations with it and you know how to handle those, you understand why it's happening, and so it's more likely for you to trust it in all of those cases. So all of that sort of leads to um, increased trust in agents as well. Okay, so beyond the characteristics of the individual human and the individual agent, it's also important to think about how the combination of these uh, multiple players within the team, um, how that can impact trust as well as the task that they are performing. Um, so we hear the word team used a lot. Um, so I think it's important before we kind of jump into some of this to talk about what teams are and what some of the key defining features are that make it different from any other group of individuals. Um, so when we talk about teams, the key feature that makes it a team and not a group is that the individuals within the group or the team are working interdependently, meaning that they rely on one another in order to accomplish a shared goal. So they have to have something that they're, they're both working toward or that they're all working toward, um, and they have to rely on each other in order to get the job done. So in teams, um, we like to say that teams are more than the sum of their parts, right? It's not just everybody kind of doing their thing and throwing it on the table and we're done, that you have to actually interact and work together uh, in order to be successful. And so as we uh, think about um, the, this key feature and we think about uh, trust, um, this reliance on one another means that there are some unique factors that can influence trust that I'll talk about here. So um, one important consideration with human agent teams or really teams in general is team composition. And what that means is what are the characteristics and the configuration of characteristics across the different members of a team? So when we talk about uh, human agent teams, one of the things that has been uh, researched is the ratio of humans to agents within a team. So do we have more humans, more agents, all of one, all of the other, or you know, some combination thereof? 
Um, and what the research has generally found is that humans trust other humans more than they trust agents. So um, when uh, thinking about trust in the agents within a team, when there are more humans within the team, people trust the agents more. Because I think we like to have that comfort factor of having more humans being able to step in and take over and override whatever the agent's doing if it starts to make an error. Um, and so um, this also then uh, extends over into uh, leadership and, and thinking about agents as leaders, okay? Similar kind of concept. Uh, the literature uh, indicates that leaders, um, uh, that uh, humans prefer to have human leaders than, than uh, agent leaders. Not really all that surprising. Um, however, uh, as we increasingly look towards more autonomous agents, um, then or organizations and, and uh, uh, teams are going to start to incorporate uh, more agents that are able to make decisions um, on their own. And so, um, and look towards uh, uh, autonomous agent leadership. Um, so, there are some studies that have started to look at this and what, what this looks like and, and really digging into the human uh, leadership literature. Um, we know that generally speaking, uh, people do better or, and have better outcomes, so they tend to perform better, um, they tend to be happier, etc. when they have a leader who is motivational, inspiring, um, this is called a transformational leader. So it's someone who's, who's kind of creating a, a vision, a shared vision, and kind of, you know, um, uh, shepherding their their followers towards that okay um, a transactional leader is someone who really is more of what we think of as like a manager someone who's kind of organizing things and, and delegating but not really kind of providing that that you know vision um, so um, within the um, human agent teams literature what we're finding is that there is some marginal <laughs> um, uh, uh, some some literature that shows that we marginally trust um, uh, trans or transformational uh, agent leaders more, um, but not quite to the same extent that we maybe do with humans. So it, it's unclear if we expect the same things um, in, in our agent leaders and expect them to behave the way that a human leader would, or if we're expecting them to function a little bit differently and what our preferences are. So more research on that is needed. Factors associated with how a team interacts such as proximity and how uh, and communication also play a role in trust within uh, human agent teams. Um, so proximity refers to how close you are, uh, your physical space with uh, another individual or, or you know any other object. Um, similar to studies in social psychology, we we are finding in the human agent teams literature that um, individuals trust agents when they are closer in proximity to them, and this is the case in both. Um, in person and in virtual environments. Um, so when um, individuals are even in virtual environments, uh, there was a study that, that looked at um, the agent was kind of programmed to make a very unexpected movement. And what they found was that individuals would kind of move away from the agent, right? Because they weren't really sure what it was doing. And so what they were doing was that they were increasing the, the distance, right? Increasing the space between them and the agent as an indication that they didn't really trust them. So um, proximity and trust are, are kind of related in that regard. Um, communication characteristics also come into play. So um, generally speaking, um, when whether we're talking about verbal communication or nonverbal communication, and whether we're talking about that being uh, us talking um, uh, via you know spoken word or via things like text or chat, um, humans like more communication. I'm going to trust you more if I'm interacting with you. Not, not overly surprising. However, um, there are some interesting findings that um, etiquette also matters with agents. So when we think about interacting with humans, the way that we communicate that we're polite and that we engage in these social norms of communication also seem to extend over to our expectations for agents. So when agents are patient, when they don't interrupt, um, and um, when they are only providing assistance when requested, we trust them more. Um, there's also some research that shows that the voice of the agent matters. Um, so whether it's a human voice or a synthetic voice. Uh, so people prefer human voices. And so how many of you have seen Interstellar? 
movie. Okay, so you know TARS in Interstellar? It looks nothing like a human, right? So some of the things that Meredith talked about looks nothing like a human. It's just a huge uh, metal contraption. Um, but it has a human voice. And of course, in kind of looking through this liter literature and thinking about it, as a viewer, I trusted that TARS was going to do whatever it took to help the team succeed in its goal and to, to take care of the humans. And so um, kind of just an interesting uh, thought exercise in terms of what is it that we actually uh, look for in agents. So, all right, and then finally, uh, characteristics of the task can also influence trust. Um, however, in both of these cases with task complexity, which is basically how, um, how complex the task is with its uh, duration or with uh, how much is needed to complete it um, or how many kind of component parts it has, um, as well as the risk that's associated with that, that task, the jury's kind of out on that, on whether um, we trust agents more when it's a complex task or when, whether it's a simpler task. Um, the argument could be that, um, and there has been uh, research that has found that when tasks are more complex, that the, uh, the potential for errors is greater. And so individuals may prefer not to have that agent as part of their team. They wanna rely on themselves and so they wanna rely on humans. Um, but the other argument is that an agent in the mix may reduce the complexity, right? It can take some of that work off your back. So thinking about like chat GPT, um, a lot of people are using it to kind of simplify the work um, that it's doing some of the work for you. And then what you actually have to do as the human is, is a much simpler task. And so the research is uh, mixed on that. Um, also in terms of risk, um, some uh, studies have found, for instance, going back to the car example, one study found that um, in higher risk conditions like curvy roads, um, that um, uh, people uh, trusted their, their agents less. And I can, uh, similar to Jesse, I, I can kind of understand that. I've almost been catapulted out of my Tesla too many times on uh, curvy roads uh, or where it you know, sees a car crossing the lane you know, a quarter mile ahead and decides to slam on the brakes, yeah. right? Um, and so there are some places where I, I also turn off that auto steer and I, I turn off the, um, the, you know, the, the speed regulation as well. So, um, so anyway, again though, there, the jury's out. There are some mixed findings in this regard. All right, so we've talked a lot about what builds trust in agents, but we're also here to talk about violation as well. So what happens when this doesn't go right, when we have those big mistakes, more like what did that agent just do? Um, and that's what has been studied under the guise of trust violation and repair in human agent teams. And plain and simple, essentially trust is lost in an agent anytime it deviates from our expectations in some way. What those expectations are probably depend on the context, but that's what's gonna break our trust. And so when that happens, a lot of the research is focused on what causes those changes in expectations, um, what influences how severe that loss of trust is, and then how do we fix it. And so research has looked at a couple of aspects of this. Um, for example, it's looked at the difference between competency-based and integrity-based violations. If you go back to um, that concept was mentioned by Meredith earlier. So did the agent do something that was what you would consider a can-do mistake, right? Like it, it, it could have done that, but it didn't. It was an error in terms of its ability to do something. It was missing some sort of a function, right? Um, this would be, for example, um, like a, an agent not sensing something correctly. It doesn't have the right software to do that versus an integrity violation, which is more of a will-do issue, right? So it's more of um, getting into those like moral judgments. Would it make the same choice that you would in terms of being aligned with your values? So who in here has seen iRobot? Love that movie. Um, so if you think about that story, the, the main premise is that there is an AI robot that makes a choice to save an adult instead of a child based on um, an assumption of survivability, right? So it used data and it made the best choice it could, but our main protagonist believes that is the wrong choice. It was not the choice that aligns with their values and that's where the whole big issue comes in. This research also has looked at timing of violations. Is it worse if it's early, if it's late? There's a little bit of mixed evidence there, but we also look at that and we'll talk about that a bit. Um, we, it looks at the severity of consequences. Not surprisingly, the worse the, the severity, the, the worse the outcome of that violation, the more you are going to lose trust in that agent. And then we've also looked at the best way to repair trust after violation, and that's a pretty complicated area of research, but most of it has focused on apologies and denials <coughs> and the way that those things are worded, the aspects of those apologies. Um, but there's still a lot, a lot of gaps in this particular literature. Um, 
which is what we have been trying to address with some of our research. So um, we're going to present a little bit of the findings from one of our projects, which was funded by the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. And essentially, we were trying to um, do things a little differently than the previous research. So previous research tends to focus on one human and one agent. A lot of what we just talked about looks at that, right? We're focused on teams with multiple heterogeneous or very different agents in that team. Um, previous research has focused on agents as a tool or as a recommender, right? We're really trying to make them positioned as interdependent teammates that take on a full role in that team. Previous research has looked at agent characteristics like anthropomorphism, reliability, and that makes a lot of sense. Those are big predictors, but we're really interested in the event characteristics. So what about the violation? What about the repair, which we haven't quite gotten to that's this coming year? Um, what about those events is going to influence the trust? <laughs> Previous research has ve very limited focus on time. There is some. Um, it, it scratched the surface, but we're very explicitly looking at trajectories over time from multiple different reference or targets within that team. And then previous research has had a pretty heavy emphasis on self-report measures, which makes sense. Trust is in the eye of the beholder to some extent. Only you can tell me how much you really trust things. That said, there's other ways to get at that, and we'll talk about that. Um, and then previous research has also looked at use behavior. Do you use it? Do you listen to its recommendation? And that is a, a good indicator of trust, right? But there's more to it than that. There's other behaviors that are dependent on trust. And so our research has really tried to broaden the toolkit and consider not just self-report measures, but also unobtrusive ways of getting at trust and also looking at trust behaviors beyond use to see how that reflects trust. So our research is multi-level, event-based, dynamic, and multi-method in nature. So our main research question is in multi-agent acts, so not just one agent, one person, what influences the trust the human has? We are still focused on that human's trust toward the agent. One day, we'll ask how much the agent trusts the human, but we're not there yet. Um, how much trust do they have in all of the different agents in their team and also the team as a whole? Because as team researchers, when you actually look at team trust in my field, you look at how much you trust the whole team. But very little hat research has actually done that. Um, so you'll see in the little diagram, our particular paradigm is a five person team. It's one human participant working with four different agents and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But within this experiment, we are essentially manipulating three primary variables the frequency of violation, how many, when does it occur, and then who did it. And I think that last piece is probably our biggest, our most novel contribution because nobody else has really looked at looking at multiple agents at once. There is some swarm research, I should say that, but it's a little different in the way that it looks like. So in order to study this, what we found is that there's just not a whole lot of off-the-shelf test beds that let you do that, and so we had to build our own. Um, so luckily we have a good relationship with the Air Force Research Lab Grill, um, which they develop simulations, and so we had them work on one for us, and so we developed the multi-agent team trust emergent research platform, MATTER. It's really great when your acronym, acronym works out. Very excited about that. Um, and, um, and this is where we are testing our research question, right? So this is a simulated team environment. It essentially replicates an urban search and rescue type of scenario. So you've got that one person and those four teammates. There's two aerial drones and two ground robots, but they're separated into sub-teams. And the goal of the team here is to work together to traverse this environment. And as they're going through, they've got a couple of different goals. They're trying to find and defuse IEDs, impro improvised explosive devices. They're trying to find trapped civilians and help them. And they're trying to identify any remaining enemies and report them, right? Um, but what we did here was make sure that each of these agents, the team members, have unique roles. So certain, only certain people can do certain things. The human is the only one that can defuse an IED. They're the, they're the IED specialist, right? Whereas the drones, the aerial drones, are the only ones that can search high up on rooftops that the, the individuals can't reach. And the ground robots are the only ones with the capability to remove very heavy rubble that's blocking entrances to buildings. And so what this did for us is it forces all of those team members to call on one another throughout the experiment in order to get their job done. You cannot do it by yourself. You have to call on your teammates at various points. So this is the basic exper experimental timeline that we had. I won't <coughs> talk through each of these things. Um, but basically, after the typical informed consent, um, people were equipped with some physiological sensors so we could track things like heart rate and galvanic skin response. Um, before they got to know their team, 
and then get to know the task they're about to engage in and learn about that simulation and, and what their role is gonna be. Um, after that, they were put into what's about an hour long simulation where they're working on this task and every 10 minutes during that simulation, they're getting some self-report surveys. Obviously, that's a lot of surveying, so I'll talk about the fact that we were very careful on what we asked them during those times. And then depending on the experimental condition they were in, they either experienced one or two trust violations at some point in there, and they didn't know that was coming. Though they were warned that there could be mistakes. So in terms of trust, how we measured it, we did use self-report because again, there is a lot of validity to this, but it's not the only thing we used. Um, we used two different measures, a single item, a researcher developed item, that essentially just said, how much do you trust each of these individuals from this point on in the mission, right? So like, given what you've gone through as you're moving forward, how much do you trust them? Um, and again, we want one item because there's some validity that shows that trust is a pretty intuitive concept. They're, they're valid and usable measures to actually have a one item. Um, but also, it would be way too annoying to be doing that every 10 minutes with more items, right? So we just kept it to that. We did, however, include also um, a longer, fancier scale that is multi-item that looks at trust and also distrust, which is a very different affective experience, right? Like feelings of suspicion and wariness. Um, we did that three times, the beginning, middle, and end. And we haven't gotten into that analysis yet, but we have it for a later date when we can figure out what's going on with that. So, hey, so now, what we found. So we had some really cool findings. Um, the first one was that trust is really resilient. So the next few slides, you're going to be looking at trajectories. Remember, we asked them how much they trust each agent every 10 minutes that allowed us to create trajectories. And so each of these, the colored lines represent a different agent, and the black dotted line represents your trust in the team as a whole. So what you can see here is that Rocky, who's the pink brown robot, violated about 10 minutes into the mission, violate, had a trust violation in which he missed an ID, it exploded and killed civilians, right? And so you can see that immediately there is a significant drop in trust right after that happens, right? What we also see is that it very quickly and naturally recovers again after more, a bunch of positive interactions. Okay. But it's only resilient to a point. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. Jessie came up with all the cutesy <laughs> little sayings and this, I have to give her credit, that was a thing. So, although, Trust recovers after one violation, naturally, <coughs> two violations, we did not see it recover to pre-trust levels, right? Even though they were having several positive interactions after that, right? So what this tells us is that despite this high reliability, I mean, they interacted with this thing like 50 times, and only two times did it make a mistake. Despite that, when they're hit with two violations, boom, boom, double whammy, wham, it had lasting effects on their trust. <coughs> the other thing we found was that when the violation matters, right? So later is greater. So when the, so this is early, mid, and late mission. So first 10 minutes, half an hour in, or 50 minutes in, right? And so the later that first violation happened, the more significant was a decrease in trust. So, <coughs> so one of the reasons we think this is, is because if you see, they did start with pretty high trust in these, but it continues to build. So after 49 minutes, you have a lot of trust to drop, right? So you have more to lose. Um, when this isn't the case early on, you're just starting to develop trust, right? So you don't have as much to lose. The other thing is, is expectations, right? So for 49 minutes, you interacted with this thing and it did a great job. Your expectation was for the next torturous 10 minutes, you tortured them for an hour with this task, that it was gonna do its job. So 49 minutes, when it messes up, you're like, whoa, taking it back, right? So. The other thing we found was that, was that, that th there's who done it matters. Right? So there was actually something we're calling this the adjacency effect. But so in most cases, when an agent violated, it only impacted trust in the agent who violated. However, what we found was that when there's two violations, that who does that second violation actually influences whether there is a spillover to the other agent. All right? So if you look at these graphs, in all the graphs, Rocky, the pink ground, the pink ground robot, was always the first violator. And then we we vary who the second violator was. So in the first graph, it, the second violator is Boulder, who was also a ground robot, so he's a lot like Rocky, but he was on a different team. And so only trust in Boulder was effective. In the second graph, um, Falcon, who was the drone who was on Rocky's team, was the second one who violated. So he kind of had an association there. So when he violated the second time, only trusted him was lost. But what we found was when Eagle was the second violator, so Eagle 
is a, is a drone, he's not a ground robot, he's on a totally different team, he has no connection. This was the only situation in which trust decrease actually spilled over to other agents. And we think this is because he doesn't have any association. So, so prior, it was thought of as an isolated incident. Oh, it's either that team, oh, it's either that type of robot. But when it was, a ro when it was an agent that had no affiliation, all of a sudden it seemed like a widespread problem. So here's a kind of another way of illustrating. Here you see that, so Rocky is always the first violator, V1. So in, on the left in C4, when Boulder violates, only trust in Boulder is lost. When Falcon violates, who's on the same team, right? So Rocky's the same time, same team. Only trust in Falcon is lost. But when Eagle, who has no affiliation, violates after Rocky does, now you lose trust in all of the drones. There's a spillover effect. Again, we think because this makes it seem like it's not just an isolated problem, but it's now a widespread problem. OK, so this is all well and good. <laughs> we have some really interesting findings. But you might be thinking, but Amanda, stopping my team to ask Sorry. <laughs> Stopping my team to complete a survey um, just isn't possible, or it's not reasonable. Um, and so how do we know if you trust your teammate if we don't or can't ask in a survey? Um, so I have good news. <laughs> um, humans often put out behavioral signals um, that we may not even realize that we're doing. Um, that reflect our trust. And so as scientists, what we're doing is using these non-survey kind of other uh, behavioral or physiological signals to be able to provide us a less obtrusive or a less you know, kind of disruptive way to evaluate trust. Um, as a, I, I was, I, I've been kind of thinking about this. As a psychologist, um, when I say, tell people that I'm a psychologist, I usually get the, oh, so you must be analyzing these right now, right? <laughs> and I'm usually like, no, no, you know, like that's not really how it works. And now I'm kind of like, well, <laughs> maybe I am, or it could be. <laughs> um, so, um, so, okay, the, the one way to do this um, is through behavioral indicators of trust. So uh, this means that we can directly observe the behaviors of the team, um, whether that's the agent or the humans. Um, overwhelmingly, as Jesse kind of mentioned, um, the, uh, our previous, yes, in our gaps. So um, our previous research on human agent teams has focused on what's called usage behaviors, okay? Um, and so that it assesses whether, for instance, we are um, relying too much, over-reliance on our, our agent teammate, so we are asking it to do things or to make decisions that we really shouldn't be, or under-relying where we're not having it do the things that maybe it's capable of doing and would take some of the work off of ourselves. Um, the problem with that, though, as Jesse kind of alluded to, is that that assumes that the human is the one making decisions about what the agent is going to be doing. As we move towards more autonomous teams, as we've kind of been talking about as a theme through this, is that we need to move towards thinking about ways to look at um, trust behaviorally um, in more collaborative, interdependent teams, okay? So... Uh, one way we can do that is through what we're calling context-specific behaviors, okay? Um, so what that means is uh, it's a broader set of behaviors beyond just, you know, telling an agent to do something or not. Um, and so it could, it could mean things like monitoring performance, um, providing or asking for feedback. Um, it could be motivating your teammates to behave in a particular way, so kind of giving them a, you know, kind of a prompt. Um, or looking at things like proximity, so how closely am I working with you, because we've, we know that that is an indicator of trust. Um, there are a number of ways that we can capture this, um, so, um, and, and that's the case whether we are talking about um, simulated uh, environments like we're doing with this study, or in virtual uh, teams, or in face-to-face um, -face, uh, teams as well. Um, so. I have up here a couple of examples of, uh, I'm conducting another study, it's actually running over behind Harris Commons, if you ever see a weird kind of setup happening on a Saturday, that's me. Um, and um, this is entirely human-human, but we are capturing um, these unobtrusive kind of behavioral indicators through a variety of different data streams. So we're looking at audio data, uh, so that we can capture what's being said, uh, and how is it being said. Uh, we also have video data that's capturing some of the nonverbals and the coordination that's happening among the teammates. 
Um, we also have um, sensors or, or beacons that are on the field that can capture proximity. Um, if you're familiar with an AirTag, it's kind of similar to that, okay? So an AirTag, you kind of you know, set it off, but one of the things that um, it, an AirTag also can do is capture proximity. I found this out through an interesting way. I have a seven-year-old, he went on a field trip, I stuck an AirTag on him, so I want to know where he was just in case. I'm that mom. Um, and um, when I got him in the car, I got a notification on my phone that someone else's AirTag that was registered to someone else, my husband, was traveling with me. So it's a safety notification, but it is tracking proximity. So there's a potential for us to use it to look at things like trust. Um, but we are leaving behavioral digital trace data behind every time that we are using technology, okay? So this is how you're getting like, you know, you go to the, um, you're, you're having a conversation with, you know, your daughter, your friend, whatever, and you know, they've been maybe looking at, I don't know, welding supplies. You have no interest in welding, but all of a sudden it shows up in your Facebook feed, right? Um, because your friend was near you um, and they searched. And so now um, the algorithm is able to detect that maybe you also have an interest. So I'm going to provide you some information on welding, even if that's not really the case, right? So we're leaving behind behavioral digital trace data. Um, and these kinds of things can be used for uh, assessing things like trust. So in our study, we did this in a couple of different ways. Um, so first, and you can kind of see what that looks like here. So first we assess team monitoring. So this was um, how many times the participant, the human participant clicked on the summary statistics to uh, check in on how their teammate was doing and kind of what they were up to, how they were performing. We also uh, captured how many times they were requesting assistance. Okay, so kind of similar to that usage uh, behavior, but the agents are, um, able to make decisions on their own, whether they're going to do that or not um, in, in um, these kinds of teams. But um, we captured how many calls for help they uh, had. And then we also had what we kind of call these like nudge, uh, which essentially is a prompt to ask the agent to search faster or to search more carefully. <coughs> so um, we found that humans do in fact behave differently based on their trust in agents. Um, in particular, we found that as trust in an agent increased, participants were more likely to both request assistance from the agent and to redirect the agent to search houses more quickly. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do though here is to evaluate combinations of different behaviors. This is something that the literature has not done. They've kind of focused on individual behaviors. Um, but we are focusing on uh, or trying to identify are there particular combinations of things that are a better indicator of put when you look at them together. So you can think of this kind of like when you go to a, I like to use the doctor analogy, okay? When you go to the doctor um, you, and you have your exam, um, they don't just say, okay, now go to Quest and get your blood work, uh, get your cholesterol done, right? They'll usually give you kind of a, a multitude of different tests to go get. Go get your CBC done, get your cholesterol, oh, maybe you're you know, having some uh, uh, cardiac health concerns and so um, we're going to, uh, uh, have you put on a Holter monitor and maybe go get a cardiac ultrasound, right? So you've got all these different tests that are gonna be done. Um, which any one of those tests is not going to give you the full picture, right? So your, your CBC is not going to tell you a whole lot about your heart health. Um, and it could tell you about a lot of other things, right? But when you put all of those things together, the doctor's better able to make a diagnosis and say, okay, here is the problem. Right? Here's the illness or here's the, the you know, kind of malady that you're experiencing. And so we're doing that with, uh, we're doing that with our uh, study as well, okay? Um, so we've been putting together uh, um, multiple behavioral indicators and we're moving towards also doing this with uh, physiological data. Um, and what we are finding is that looking at the combinations of behaviors is in fact a stronger indicator of trust than if we were to focus on any one of those individual behaviors alone. So looking at the patterns is a, a useful uh, direction. Um, another way beyond behavioral uh, data or behavioral indicators is physiological indicators. So I see a lot of you um, have uh, Apple Watches or Fitbits. I've kind of been looking around the room. So you're already you know, kind of doing some of this, right? You have wearables on. Um, so there are a variety of different physiological indicators that have been uh, looked at within the trust literature. So things like eye tracking, um, how long are you looking at something or how many times are you kind of switching between looking at one thing or another. Um, vocal pitch has been looked at. Um, 
uh, neural signatures, but a couple of them have been, and, and there's been some limited uh, support for, for those, um, but the cardiovascular, the, the ECG heart rate uh, variability, and the galvanic skin response have um, been found to uh, be good indicators of trust. So, um, for instance, you know, heart rate variability and, and level. Um, you know, if you get the, you know, your heart, sometimes when I'm in like a particularly challenging meeting, I'll get an indicator that, you know, a heart rate warning that's like, your heart rate has gone above 120 beats per minute. And I'm like, oh boy, okay, yep, yep, I'm having, a, <laughs> I'm having an anxious <laughs> response, so I'm stressed out right now. Um, and so that's, you know, kind of an indicator of my psychological state, right? And so we can kind of use things like that, similar things to that, um, to also evaluate trust. Um, so in our study, uh, we used a couple of these that uh, uh, physiological measures that have more support within the literature. Um, so particularly, uh, we have this um, Shimmer physiological sensor suite that we're using um, that ha assesses both heart rate and our, um, our GSR, our, our sweat response. Um, we're in the process of analyzing that data, so unfortunately I don't have uh, results to share with you yet. All right, so where are we going with this? Um, so um, as we move forward, uh, we're gonna continue with this line of work on developing unobtrusive measures um, that incorporate both physiological and behavioral indicators. Um, so again, we're kind of is expanding on our preliminary analyses to incorporate um, both types of indicators and using things like machine learning to help us detect what some of those patterns are amongst the multiple indicators, um, because it seems like there's some promise there. Um, this would have important implications, for instance, of being able to, you know, someday, uh, you know, down the road, uh, be able to more passively be able to, as a leader, for instance, be able to assess the trust within your team and then be able to intervene a little bit earlier than if you have to rely on a survey. Um, we also are getting ready for uh, our next uh, study this year. We're looking at trust repair. Um, so we've looked at trust violation. That's what we presented today. Now we're moving on to look at trust repair. Um, and uh, we're focusing on a, a couple things about uh, that, the trust repair strategy and its effectiveness. Namely, how many agents are attempting to repair? Is it just one agent or is it multiple agents? And who is doing the repairing? So is it the violator, so the agent that committed the trust violation? Um, or is it the same type of violator or a different type of violator? So is it, uh, or agent, sorry, so is it um, that the um, ground robot uh, committed the, the error, um, but the drone is um, uh, uh, apologizing, um, or is it you know, the, the same type of agent? Um, we're also looking at the same or different sub-teams because they kind of work in pairs. Um, and then, or is it the whole team that's, that's providing that repair strategy? So we're excited and grateful to have this opportunity to be uh, conducting this research and to be um, on kind of the forefront of, of looking at um, human agent or human autonomy teaming. Um, and so um, I'd like to thank you all for, for coming this evening. And at this point, I'll open it the floor for any questions or comments that you might have. Do you have an example of a transactional agent leader? Um, so if, if this will be a, an instance of, um, so if you, Transactional leaders are ones that are kind of focused more on like organizing or delegating things. So you might have an agent that is just kind of saying, okay, do this, do this task, right? So it's, it's maybe more of a, um, like an AI type system that is, you know, organizing tasks among the team and saying, okay, you, you know, you human I, do this thing. I get it, I know the difference. I'm asking you, are there physical examples out there? Somebody built something that you would look at and regard as a transactional leader agent? A real world example of somebody doing that? Transactional leadership is hard to come by. I've just spent the last couple of months trying to find one in the human realm. <laughs> it's not easy. So is there is there something in the AI world that you would consider a demonstration of transactional leadership? I, I mean, I'm kind of it's thinking. Okay to say no. I mean, well, so I'm, I'm thinking of it's not in um, like a multi multi agent or multi person context, but um, of course, you know, the algorithm on Facebook it has been giving me <laughs> motion um, as a tool that is basically you you know kind of say like. Well, here's generally speaking kind of what I need to get done, and it makes all the decisions for like 
what, what to prioritize, when to do the work, you know, basically you just kind of say like, well, here's what my capacity is, or I have this meeting or whatever, and it says, okay, do this here and, and at this time. Um, so it's not really inspiring you necessarily to, you know, kind of towards a, a, a goal. Um, it's just kind of like make, saying like, do this at this time and, and puts it all in your calendar for you. So okay. it could be something kind of similar to that. Uh, okay, that's far afield in my opinion from transactional leadership. I'm sorry. I just, so uh, I would take that as the answer is no. Would you call that transformational leadership? As a, like what would the alternative? I'm sorry. My brain and my, my mouth are not often connected. <laughs> what I was talking, did I say transactional? Yes. Because yes. I, what I was asking for is transformational. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave you a transactional example. <laughs> yes, yes, a very good one, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and they're easy, I, I won't say they're easy to find, but yeah, there are lots of examples of those. So my question, when I said I was <coughs> spent time looking for transformational leadership in the human realm, my question is, are there examples out there of a transformational AI leader? Well, so I don't know about leader, but I'll say so like I'm a runner and I use the Nike app. And so it it can cheer me on, it can recommend run, it links me with other people at my, so like it's not necessarily a leader, but it, it's very influential in motivating me and it does influence me to do different tasks. Um, and so there's actually a lot of, I don't know if it's leadership, but a lot of technology that that, that is, is, is persuasive technology, they call it, that can, can influence your behaviors, right? And get you to do things based on telling you what other people are doing, motivating you. I mean, like, I, how many people do you know who have a, have a Fitbit monitor their steps, right? And so now they change their pattern, behaviors of what they're doing, just because they have this intelligent agent that's tracking information and giving them information and encouraging them and giving them badges. And, and so these are things that a transformational leader would do. I don't know if you could call those leaders, but I guess that's the issue. Is yeah. like, is it just transformational? But you know, maybe the technology isn't yeah. there yet. And so we've actually talked about this a lot, is because when we're looking at teams, agent teams, it's like, how do you develop a human agent team in which the agent is a leader? That would look very different than what we're really used to studying. You would have, first have to have the intelligence, right, the autonomy. And typically our test beds are very kind of Wizard of Oz. Like they don't have, like they're scripted to do things. They don't have true autonomy and true intelligence. Um, but if you did have that, could you set up a, a, a test bed in which there was an agent who was kind of the leader and, and tasking and, and telling people what to do? And that, I don't, I don't know of any world examples like that now, but I also, I think it's possible in the future. You anticipate a time when that leader would be able to, for example, using your example, assess team members, uh, you know, over the short term and long term, Joe's the best guy for this job, but he's having a bad day, so I'm going to give it to you. You see that coming? Um, I I would think that it's possible. Again, I'm not a future seer, so I can't guarantee it. And I'm also we're not on the tech side, so I'll throw that out there. I just really don't understand how this is developed. We use it on human, like we figure out what we do with it, right? Um, but I I feel like you could definitely see a situation in which. Again, if people were consenting to it, I think that's what gets funky with the unobtrusive measures, right? If everyone's okay with having their heart rate and their sweat response monitored regularly so that we can intervene on it. Um, if we can get everybody on board with that, yeah, I could see a situation where, again, the same way it says, hey, someone stepped into your car and it's like this, your heart rate went above this. Um, the recommendation, like, why don't you go get a coffee? It seems like you're tired. I could see that being something that is being, you know, put through the system and you could have the team members and team leader actually step in and intervene. <coughs> Well, and so like I have a friend who works kind of in the health, like the insurance business, and she works from home, and her computer monitors when she's working, when she's not, her productivity. So I, I think the technology is is there where you could have a system monitoring all your workers and figuring out who's efficient, who's not, and directing them and reallocating tasks. I don't think that's too far off as far as capabilities. Whether or not companies would be open, and workers would be open to that, and yeah. as a, there's ethical difference, but also more I'm transactional. Sorry, yeah, 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 for sure. Well, I just think that example you just said, when I went into the business and everyone started getting those cell, you know, the cell phones were first out, and then the big selling point, like the guy from AT and T, oh, but you can figure out where your people are and how long they're staying. And I mean, I'm the boss. I don't, I want to trust my employees. I don't want to monitor where they are. Their job performance will reflect. They're doing their job, right? I, I just think they, there's 
it's there's backlash, a big backlash. Yeah, there is, like, but it also so my dissertation <laughs> looked at um, <laughs> my dissertation looked at uh, the uh, at monitoring as a repair strategy for different kinds of violations, and so with humans, with humans yeah. So caveat. Well, actually, they thought it was a human. It was a scripted Confederate agent that was told to behave in a particular way. We switched the Wizard of Oz. So, um, so, but they thought it was a human. But, um, but anyway, when it was um, an intentional violation, having that, so something that like, you know, I chose to either, you know, kind of, I chose to, you know, kind of further myself at the expense of my team. Um, when that was what the team, what has been done, um, putting a system, system in place to monitor or have for people to have the capability to monitor their teammates increase their trust more afterwards because they trusted the system. They didn't trust the, you know, they weren't trusting the, the teammates, right? The teammate already demonstrated he would do, you know, he would t look out for himself. He didn't care about me as the, the team member. But having a monitoring system in place gave me confidence that maybe he at least wouldn't engage in that behavior again. That was, again, he was human. Studies were with agents that were purposeful, Tesla like. All right? So they, they, they had a certain uh, domain of, of um, activities that they could do and, and, and decisions, certain domain of decisions that they could make. Uh, and, and you measure trust based on violations. Uh, do you think that your observations and results might carry over toward a team that would have a generalized AI or, or more of a generative AI? Uh, <laughs> and something like that. So um, it's, it's 
just interesting that companies yeah. are willing to take I think, well, I, think I, I goes, see it as a risk. I think that goes to the, the task complexity, though, right? Yeah. So, you know, that <laughs> being a CEO is a highly complex job. Um, there are a lot of decisions that have to be made, a lot of factors that have to be taken into account, right? And there is, you know, some evidence, at least, that, you know, as task complexity increases, um, that we may not trust that the agent is not going to make some errors, right? Because it's, you know, it's not, you have to hope that it's, you know, programmed for all of those things, right? Um, and so, I could see that being well, understanding that, that a human being or an agent could make, could make a mistake right. uh, is, I guess what I'm asking is if you have more generalized agents as opposed to a purposeful agent, uh, do you feel like the, the recovery from a, from a trust violation might be treated the same or, or differently? I guess is the question I'm asking. I feel like in that case, you get into that realm where you don't understand what it's doing as well, right? Like if it's this big generalized AI with all of these domains it's just much harder for you as a human to hold everything about it and its functioning in your head. And so until I guess it would need to be doing a lot of like explain like explainable AI stuff where it's explaining why it's doing that, in my opinion. Yeah. It would need to be and, and trust is trust is about, you know, there's a bunch of definitions of it, but you know, ultimately it's how much risk you're willing to take based on your confident expectations of whether it's going to perform well or not, right? And so if you have clear expectations of what it's capable of and what you should expect from it, then that's a different scenario than here's this <laughs> nebulous, very abstract agent that I don't really know what to expect of it, right? And so um, that may be part of it too, is you know, kind of um, information and, and you know, kind of establishing expectations of what you can expect from that. And it depends on the individual, right? So recently in the news, there was some lawyer who like let ChatGPT write his arguments, and they ChatGPT made it up, and he got I don't know, you know, whatever held in contempt. So it's like some people are very trusting. I think this is what we're seeing is this is an area in which um, the technology has gotten ahead of like our understanding of it and the legislation of it. So I'm, it will be interesting where all this goes in the you know next five ten years. And as a culture researcher, I have to mention that this is something where the cultures differ entirely. So the way that like we in the West and, and in the United States are using AI and how companies are just jumping ahead and doing things. Um, I've got some, we've got some graduates who have gone off and they're working in Europe. And like for example, like they're not they're not allowed to touch that. There's they don't have these algorithms. There's a lot more emphasis on human autonomy and privacy in those European settings. And again, I don't, I don't know everything about that, but I'm definitely seeing differences in the way that this entire thing is being approached. Good question. So, thank you for your presentation. It's very interesting, thought provoking. You mentioned some movies, and a movie that I was thinking about, which was way ahead of its time, was 2001 Space Odyssey and HAL, the yeah. computer. So that was kind of an early version of artificial intelligence. So my question has to do with one other variable that I didn't hear mentioned, which has to do with the human trust versus the reliability of the technology and how well it is protected, the technology is protected, against things like hackers and doing and having an adversary do things to the technology to purposely cause it to fail. Do you do any cybersecurity work? Yeah, it's funny you bring it up because I was just looking before I came on the way. There was um, something in like the aviation news that, that there was a aircraft, 12 aircraft now reporting getting jammed over Iran. Have you guys seen this? Where like they lost like all navigation like capability because they spoofed um, their actual location, they like moved them over 6,000 miles. You know, so like we know it's out there. And so, so we've done, so I can't talk that specific example, but um, we did studies where we looked at, in an aviation context, where we looked at a pilot when they were faced with conflicting information from like their certified systems or like electronic flight back. We looked at, you know, what they trusted. And one of the, the kind of violations we introduced was the cybersecurity kind of spoofing. And what we found was that your typical operator, they couldn't tell the difference between just a system malfunction and like an actual cybersecurity attack. So in that case, I mean, maybe in retrospect, if they find out, found out it was a cybersecurity attack, it would have a more negative effect. But in general, the typical user would probably wouldn't even know it was a cybersecurity attack. So that's just kind of one thing that I've studied that's related to it. By the way, 2001 Space Odyssey was this year, was 55 years ago, 1958. Wow. Wow. <laughs> 
I was trying to follow your trust examples and, and the problems you were having in getting in. <clears throat> It seems to me the most the most concrete example of trust was if the, in these situations where the human is expecting to get some guidance or some recommendation or something from the agent, wouldn't the most concrete measure of trust being to what degree do they follow that? Like me and my GPS wizard, right? I'm about 80%. So and it's not just trust thing, I have my own ideas about the right way to do this, but that, that would be the thing. The agent is saying, go left, go right. There's been a trust violation. How often after that does the human follow that agent's guidance? May, st may still say, he may answer your question, you know, I don't trust this guy, but he's still maybe 80%, 90%. So they've actually done like a meta-analysis, like all the studies that looked around that I'm building, the answer is 70%. When they are sem less than 70% reliable, we cease using them. But 70% over many, many studies is typically if they're That's above the confidence that. level. So I'll, I'll go with That's the reliability. The, what, the what amount of all of your sources of information are less than 70% reliable? <laughs> you know, I mean, what happens in that situation? Like what you're talking about. Well, so I mean, guess you, you no longer. It's 50 /50, right? right, you no longer rely on it, and you rely on your own judgment, not on the autonomous agent. Mm -hmm. It's no longer giving you anything you might as well just disregard. Yeah, but I mean, I would say that rely reliance or usage behavior is, again, that's why the, the literature studied it so much. Like, you're totally right. It's like the first go-to for that. I think what's interesting is there's situations where you may not do that. Your workload ramps up and you have no choice but to use it, so now it's dis like that, that behavior is not connected to trust anymore. So I think that's why we're interested in using that and, an and paradigm rather than or, right? Let's look at that behavior and heart rate and skin response and their um, eye tracking, right? And like <coughs> with that, can we really pinpoint that's the moment trust change? Yeah, and right. we actually, I'm oh, sorry. So we actually looked at in aviation context, all the things that influence whether or not you use a system. And it, it, it partially depends on your trust, but it depends on a lot of other things too, right? You use, they, these pilots use systems they don't always trust because they're trained to, they have to, they have no other, other alternative, they don't have time to seek an alternative. They're, it's a high risk situation. So there's many things that actually influence whether or not you use the system, not just your trust in it. But to your point, with these more uh, teams with more autonomous agents, they're not gonna have a choice, right? Even of whether they're using it or not, or whether I'm giving it um, you know, instructions to, to you know, do something for me, right? Um, it's, it's going to be that the agent's doing what the agent's gonna do, and then I have to make a decision about, you know, am I going to follow along with what the agent maybe wants me to do, right? Um, and that's an area that um, is, new, right? Like we, um, we're, we're, we're kind of just getting into that being something that people are really even um, investigating. But I, I think Jesse's right though about like, it's an and of, you know, okay, so how much am I doing, um, how much am I looking to it for help and how much am I then doing what it asks of me? And so there's that gets to that interdependency of, you know, really kind of relying on one another, that I'm relying on you and I'm, I'm you know, kind of letting you rely on me and doing the things that you are, are indicating that you need for me as a teammate. Dr. Carroll, um, great conversation. Uh, if we can just take one or two more questions and we'll wrap up. Okay. Dr. Yeah. 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 Just a um, great presentation. Thank you very much. I just want to go off your um, comments. I think that, um, and I have a question on top of it. I think people like your Garmin, uh, you don't trust the 70%. Exactly what I repair. That's what we were able to get. Perfect, thanks. Last one. Well, 
the example that you gave was basically a combat team scenario. Mm -hmm. where, what other kinds of teams might involve agents and humans where this might apply to other than maybe a combat team? Maybe a medical team that's taking a look at a particular surgical situation? <laughs> yeah, so, what so might be some yeah, I have, other a, I have a PhD student who's actually got a fellowship in Ireland to do robotic um, team surgery. And so she works with surgery teams that have a robot surgeon and looks at, in that case, it's like one agent, many humans, but they're using that agent and they are, you know, work, they're working with that robot to do surgery. Would that work along the same kind of scenarios that you're talking about it's here? A good or question. That, or would that be a, a, a different situation? You'd have to look at, is, is that much, that much different than the combat scenario? I would say, I mean, the risk level of that is similar. Um, and so, life you know, death. you know, it's, yeah, life and death, right? Whether it's, you know, that there's, you know, kind of been an explosion and someone has died or, you know, you made an error with someone on the table and now, you know, same, same outcome. So I think the, the risk level, there's probably a lot more commonality um, in, in um, between combat and medical than, you know, maybe even some, you know, kind of just knowledge creation, you know, scientific teams or, or something along that line. Uh, the other ones I was going to mention was like emergency response. So like after big natural disasters, when you're doing search and rescue, and you don't want to be sending people into dangerous situations, I think they're using robots in some of those cases as well. So. And, and certainly the scenario of an aircraft where you have multiple systems on board and a few humans, and, this, and the agents are the systems out there that are providing all this information, mm -hmm. good or bad, and yet the humans on board have to go figure out do I believe my instrumentation, yeah. or do I believe I'm in my gut feel? Yeah. Does this also apply to, to that kind of a scenario? Well, that's where most of I mean, autonomy and automation research started in aviation. So yeah. it's kind of you know that's so a lot of these findings came from that domain. So absolutely, it's high risk. You know, there's a lot at stake. It's a complex problem. There's you know a lot of information coming into you. So absolutely, this, I think a lot of this would generalize to that. Dr. Carol Lavin.